Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Beginning at verse uh, 31. Here's what Paul says. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. Thus ends our reading. This morning I want you to just repeat this with me because uh, I need you to make this as a daily declaration. Repeat after me. I declare. God is for me. God is Say it one more time. I declare, I declare God is for me. God is for me. Amen. Amen. Thus ends uh, our reading, and I want you to be seated in the presence of the Lord. Matt, if you can, can you uh, raise this up? As, um, as we get to the end of what is chapter 8 of, of, Rome, of Romans, Paul's intention isn't to, um, to depress us about life. Rather, uh, what Paul wants to do is emphasize the fact that in the midst of life's most difficult experiences, we are always victorious. Hear me. I don't care how bad life seems to be. In the end, we will always be victorious. But more than that, uh, pa pa Paul wants us to understand that sometimes life's most negative situations are the means by which God intends to take us to a better and a higher place. If all we ever do is have a narrow vision of who God is, then what we'll think is, uh, I've got to, I've got to have this, or I've got to be this, or I've got to do this. And uh, if things are not working uh, in what I consider to be uh, my favor, then I will assume that God isn't, uh, that God isn't for me. But I got news for you. Even when life is at its worst and craziest, God can take a lemon, take some water, and some sugar, and turn it into lemonade. See, it's not the situation that determines where God is. It's the faith we choose to place in him. And, and there's a point at which um, we have to reach the spiritual conclusion that no matter what the situation is, God is for me. The moment we come to, uh, to, to that consciousness, we, we, the situation won't matter. We see life uh, completely different. Pa matter of fact, pa Paul, Paul reaches this conclusion uh, early in his discussion, and I, and I don't want you to miss it, because pa Paul said, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up 
for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Literally, what, uh, what, 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 uh, what, what Paul is saying is that if God gave his dearest and best for our salvation, then you ain't got to worry about money. If God gave, if, if God gave his, his dearest and his best in order that, that we might be his sons and, and daughters, then, then you don't have to worry about conflict and confusion because after all, if God gave Jesus for us, then, then you don't have to worry about anything else. Now I, I, I don't want you to I don't want you to miss that miss that because in the midst of uh, of of all of our craziness and uh, all of the the, the, the the things that can go wrong in life, um, we can start thinking to ourselves uh, that, that 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 maybe God maybe God isn't 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 on my side. But 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 I got news for you, child of God. That, that if you look at what Jesus did in order for all of us to be saved, you don't ever have to guess whether or not God is on our side. And so there are three things I want to I want to share with you. I, they, they blessed me this week, and I, I believe they they will they will bless, they will bless you. Uh, the, the first thing I want to show you is that I reflect compassionately because of His designation. I, I reflect compassionately because of his his designation um, Christianity alone it, it, it's the only of all of the world's uh, religions Christianity alone makes God's love and God's acceptance something which is offered to undeserving people without cost or without condition I don't want you to miss this that, that you can be saved, I don't care how wretched you lived. That, that God, when, when he sent his son uh, Jesus to die on the cross for us, Jesus did not pay for some of our sins, he paid for all of them. I, indeed, the Bible makes it clear that that, that salvation is not something we can earn. It comes as God's free gift. J Jesus gave himself as a sacrifice for our sins. In, in, in the Old Testament, sacrifices were continually offered uh, in, in the temple. The sacrifices showed the Israelites the seriousness of, of their sins. Blood had to be shed before sins could be pardoned. But the blood of animals could not actually remove the sin. Those sacrifices were only a covering for sin. Jesus became the literal embodiment of God's grace. He is the clearest picture of God's love. That, that's what makes grace uh, so, so amazing. Grace is the defining element of what it means to be be a Christian. Philip Yancey, in writing about grace, says grace means that there is nothing we can do to make God love us more. And grace means that there is nothing we can do to make God love us less. It, it, it was Jesus' sacrifice that paid the penalty for our sins. He took our place. He paid our debt. He took away all of our stain. He stood in our place. Matter of fact, in the, in the opening of, uh, of, of this chapter in verse 1, Paul puts it this way. He says, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, there is no remaining guilt of sin, no remaining penalty for having done wrong. When Christ comes into your life, you are pardoned, not paroled. I got to say that again. When Christ comes into your life, you are pardoned, not paroled. The transgression has been removed. Yes, people can say, I remember what you used to do. But hear me, when they go look for the record, it has been expunged. This is not a provision about some sins having been forgiven. 
God doesn't forgive some and hold us guilty for others. He, he wipes the slate clean. Even when we have feelings of guilt and remorse from our past, those feelings aren't the reality. The reality is that all of us who are saved have been forgiven. Somebody say, I've been forgiven. Pa pa Paul recognizes a very simple and important truth that we act according to what we know we are. If we're, de if we're deceived into thinking that we're not uh, what God says we are, then we're going to keep on acting that way. That's why the way to break the power of the most vicious and evil habit is to see yourself as God sees you. What I'm telling you is that if you don't start seeing yourself as a saved, blood-bought child of God, you will never live as a saved, blood-bought child of God. But there ought to be somebody who wakes up every morning and looks theirself in the mirror and says, I thank God I am saved. I thank God I am redeemed. I'm bought with a price. Jesus has changed my whole life. See, the enemy understands that I'll never walk in the newness of life if I'm still burdened by the guilt of my former life. It's for that reason he's constantly trying to remind me of who I used to be and what I used to do. The real problem is that there are people who can't see your value because all they can see is the mistakes and the failures of your past. And so all they can talk about is who you used to be. But hear me, that might be an issue for them, but it's not an issue for Jesus. <laughs> see, the, the, see, Jesus already died to redeem your past. And we can all rejoice in the knowledge that a seeking Savior will always find a sinner who is looking for a new beginning. What I'm telling you, child of God, is that when, no matter what you've done wrong in this life, Jesus says, I love you still. The reason people want to remind you of your past is in order to rob you of your future. I got to say that again. The reason people want to remind you of your past is so that they can rob you of your future. But I reject the report of the enemy over my life. I am what God says I am. I am the righteousness of God. H having received salvation doesn't mean for a minute that I've, I've reached perfection. I, 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 I'm saved, but I'm not perfect. I, I still suffer from faults and failures. In fact, I would posit with you this morning that those very failings are the things that cause me to have compassion for others. See, see, if salvation made us perfect, we wouldn't be able to identify with sinners. Because all we would do is look down at them. But when I realize my own shortcomings, it places me in a better position to help somebody else. What I'm telling you is that there ought to be somebody in here this morning who can say, I know what it feels like to have to get up again. I know what it feels like to, to have to pull the pieces of a broken life back together. I, I know what it, what it feels like to have come short of God's glory yet again. See, it's that, it's that kind of knowledge that gives you the compassion to reach out and, and minister to others. It's that knowledge that enables you to speak encouragement to those who are ready to give up and throw in the towel. That, 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 it's that compassion. It's that compassion that, that causes David in, in Psalm 51 to, to say, restore to me the joy of your salvation, and, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then, then, watch this, I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Wait a minute. How can I teach somebody what I don't know? They, 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 David says, because I know what it's like to be a sinner, I can teach sinners how to get it right. 
See, it's a heart of, of compassion that, 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 that causes Jesus to encourage Peter by saying, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But, but I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Watch this. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. What, what I'm here to tell you is you can't give somebody what you don't possess. And there's somebody in here who is a stronger Christian, not because you got it right all the time, but because of all the times you got it wrong and God forgave you and got you back up on your feet. And now you're able to reach out and tell somebody else, I know you can make it because I did. Here's the second thing I want you to understand. I rejoice confidently because of his domination. Here's this interesting thing. Because the second question posed by Paul in verse 31 comes as a presupposition. It's the question is presented as if it is literally an affirmation. It's a, it's a spiritual deduction. God isn't just on your side. It's God is for you. If God is for you, who can be against you? The truth is that even the best Christian has weak moments. I, I, I don't care how much scripture you quote. The best Christian has weak moments. See, it, all of us experience those times when we don't have the confidence we wish we had about the situation. It's in those moments of challenging trials that we learn that God's care for us is so much greater than anything life can throw at you. What I want you to understand is that the key to thriving in the midst of difficult situations is for you to pray for your situation and not just for your deliverance from it. I don't want you to miss this. Because so many times when we're in the midst of challenges and disappointments and chaos and calamities, we're praying for God to get us out of it. Well, maybe God has decided, I'm not going to get you out. But I will keep you while you're in it. What I'm telling you is that there are times when God's greatest miracle is not how he got you out, but how he kept you while you were in it. In every situation I will ever encounter ought to give me a deeper sense of who God is and what God will do. There ought to be someone here this morning who can witness with me that I know what God can do because I know what God has done. The great biblical scholar Haddon Robinson said, in any situation, what you are determines what you see. What you see determines what you do. See, when you see life's challenges as another opportunity for God's power to be made manifest, you will stretch your faith to another level. <laughs> it's interesting because people will pray, God, give me more faith. And then when God gives you an opportunity to have it, you start complaining and saying, well, Lord, I didn't mean it like that. I don't, want you to, I don't want you to miss it because when you see life's challenges as another opportunity for God's power to manifest, it will cause you to stretch your faith to another level. That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do in the presence of King Nebuchadnezzar. They, they make the choice to stretch their faith without regard to the outcome, Daniel chapter 3, verse 16, says Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need 
to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. There's always this interesting thing about the words, but if not. And the but if not is not about God being able. Because they already said God is able. But God in his sovereign will may choose not to do it. And what they said is if God chooses not to do it, that's what but if not means. If God chooses not to do it, don't mess with us because we're still going to love God. We're still going to serve God. We're still going to be devoted to God. Hear me, those, those three boys walked into the fiery furnace with complete assurance about the outcome. We're going to serve God no matter what. They understood the odds were against them. They knew that the fire was already seven times hotter than usual. They knew that there was nothing they could do to change the situation. But they walked into that fiery furnace declaring God is able. And I got news for somebody listening to me this morning. Whatever situation you're walking into, you can't change the situation. But what you can declare over that situation is God is able. People might be against you. Situations might be against you. The odds might be against you. It might even seem that the world is against you. But is there anybody in here this morning that's made up your mind that no matter what is against me, I know God is for me and God is able. Those boys went into that fiery furnace with the confidence that God is for me. And hear me when I tell you that I, I might not be confident about my situation, but I am confident about the God who reigns over it. In the end, faith did not keep them out of the fiery furnace. I don't want you to miss it. They had faith, but in the end, faith did not keep them out of the fiery furnace. But you know what faith did? Faith kept them in the fiery furnace. And I believe there's somebody listening to me right now who can testify how God has shown up in your situation. No, no, God, 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 God may not have gotten you out of it, but look at how God kept you while you were in it. I, I know folks like to shout over having money running over in your pockets, but I got news for you. There's somebody listening to me who can shout about an empty pocket, and yet God kept a roof over your head, clothes on your back, food on your table. He kept you in the situation. Why? Because God... God, God is a keeper. And no, no, matter, no matter what you're going through, no matter what that situation is, is there anybody that knows God will keep you? Gets me to the last thing, and that is that I rest calmly because of his, his dedication. Here, here, here's this interesting thing, the conclusion of, uh, of this chapter. Uh, Paul, Paul gives seven different questions. And, and all of the questions really can be reduced down to one profound conclusion. And that conclusion is that God is for us. Knowing and believing this realization is the result of lessons learned through life experiences. Hear me. I don't care how much grandma told me God loves me. I had to go through some stuff in order for me to know how much God loves me. In, in this concluding uh, passage, Paul, Paul, Paul's questions are, are rhetorical. That, that is to say, um, Paul's not trying to get you to, to give a verbal answer. It, it, it's really trying to probe your mind, cause you to think 
more deeply about your situations and about the God who reigns over them. What I want you to take note of is that Paul doesn't deny that Christians face foes and difficulties and hardships. I don't care how saved and sanctified you are. Every Christian goes through something. Yet amid all of those things, his challenging question remains. If God is for us, who can be against us? And who you are as a person and collectively who we are as people can never be defined by your circumstances. Here's what I'm telling you, and I don't want you to miss this. You are always more than what you've been through. I got to say that again. You are always more than what you've been through. Who, who we are is defined by the way we deal with with those circumstances. Well, one of the things that challenges our faith is the desire to be an overcomer. I, 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 it's always amazing how folks um, um, want to be victorious, but they don't want no battles. We want to be overcomers, but we don't want to have obstacles. The, the only way to overcome is that there has to be something getting in your way. We want a testimony. But we don't want a test. That there's a generation that's suffering from low self-esteem and no ambitions because they've concluded that the situations they face are bigger than their ability to overcome them. What they fail to see is that, that that is what makes us overcomers. You, you can't be an overcomer without something to overcome. And so they whine and they pout and they complain about what's against them and who doesn't like them and, 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 and all of the challenges and obstacles that they're faced with overcoming. But I got news for them that they aren't the first generation that has faced hatred and racism. They aren't the first generation that's had to endure economic challenges. They're not the first uh, generation to have to overcome educational and societal challenges. They aren't the first generation that's had to overcome even a pandemic. What I'm telling you is that it doesn't really matter who and what is against you when you reach the conclusion that God is for you. Because no matter what I am facing, somebody faced it before I got to it. I'm not the first one. And if they overcame, then guess what? I can too. That's why I agree with, with Paul who, when he says emphatically, no, in all these things, we, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For, for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What we need to understand is that our faith walk is defined by the challenges that we must overcome. I, I know we complain that it's, it's, if it's not one thing, it's another. But, but you got to remember that in all these things, we are more than conquerors. I don't care how many things come against you. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors. It's, it's not because we've been so good. It's, it's because or because we've been so strong. It's because the Father's love is too strong to be broken. And is there anybody 
listening to me this morning that can say, God, I thank you that there is no barrier that you can't overcome, that your love will withstand every disappointment, that your love will traverse any terrain. There's somebody listening to me that when you look back over your life, you know God's love is unconditional because when you didn't have him on your mind, God still looked beyond your faults and saw your need. God doesn't love us because we're perfect or even because we get it right. God loves us despite the fact that we're imperfect people who constantly get things wrong. Hear me. Life's experiences have taught me that God is always present in my trials. (laughs) I know that there have been moments when I felt like I was all alone. But what Life has taught me is that I've never been alone. God's been with me every day, every step of the way. Even when I couldn't see him or sense him, I've come to understand that if it hadn't been for him, I would have never been made it through it. In his his book, The the Message of, of, of Romans, John Stott writes this. He says, Our confidence is not in our love for him, which is frail, fickle, and faltering, but in his love for us, which is steadfast, faithful, and persevering. Stott writes it this way. He says the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints needs to be renamed the doctrine of the perseverance of God with the saints. In other words, what he's saying is that it's not that you've been holding on, it's that God has been holding on to you. Hear me. I'm not... I'm not in the stands when it comes to life. I'm, I'm out on the playing field, and, and every day life is taking its best swing at me, and still I am here as a living testimony of God's awesome power and love. I don't care what comes my way. I know this, that God is there with me every step of the way. One of the most uplifting thoughts that we have as Christians is that God is for us. That, that one simple truth isn't something we, we know from reading these verses. That, that spiritual truth is something we grow in appreciation for as we experience his love each and every day. Hear me when I tell you I don't care how much scripture you've read, how much you've studied, how much you can quote. It's not reading the scripture that teaches you of God's love. It's the experiences that you've had day in and day out. No matter what disappointments have come, no matter what letdowns have come, no matter what challenges have come, God's love has been right there constantly showing itself over and over and over and over again. Again. What an amazing revelation it is to know that no matter what is happening in my life, God is right there for me. Trials will come. Disappointments will come. Amid life's difficulties and uncertainties, the one thing that I can hang on to is that God is there for me. I don't have to guess about whether he's there for me. All I have to do is turn back the pages of my life. And no matter what page I look on, I can see God right there getting me through it every day and every hour. I got to close. But listen, I know that Paul is asking a rhetorical question. I know Paul isn't looking for me to give an answer. But can I go ahead and just say I need to answer the question. I need to say it and I need to say it loud. I know God is for me. There's a generation that needs to know God is for me. I've got to let the devil know God is for me. I need to let my enemies know God is for me. I I need to let my family members know God is for me. I need to let my circumstances know God 
is for me. What, 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 what I'm here to tell you, children of God, is that when you start growing in that knowledge that God is for you, instead of you talking to God about your circumstances, you'll start talking to your circumstances about your God. And you'll start telling your circumstances, you need to know that God is for me because I'm more than a conqueror. I'm victorious. I, I'm waiting and walking in authority. I'm speaking with confidence because I know God is for me. When I wake up to that realization, it won't matter what comes my way. It, it won't matter what's trying to to, to, to get me down. It won't even matter what's trying to dissuade and deter me. When I come to that revelation that God is for me, <laughs> I'll be able to walk through life with my head held down high. Not because I'm bold and cocky, but because I'm confident that God is for me. Is there anybody this morning that's made up your mind? I know God is for me. Come on, stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Father, we thank you for that revelation that you're for us no matter what the situation might be. That amid our most difficult and challenging moments, you are right there to see us through it and, and to get us through it. God, when weariness is trying to pull us down, when negativity is trying to grab hold of our spirits. Put us in remembrance that you're right there. You're for us. Every day and every step of the way. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Anybody know God is for you? Why don't you thank God and rejoice? <coughs> that God is God is for me if you're here today and don't know Christ in the pardoning of your sin and you're saying what must I do to be saved believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved if you're saved and you're saying pastor I know I'm saved I've got a relationship but I'm out of fellowship the Bible says God is just and faithful to forgive us of our sins to cleanse us from all unrighteousness he says I will in no wise cast you out Thirdly, if the Lord has moved in your spirit and said, this is the place, I want you to set down your spiritual roots to become all that I've ordained for you to be. The Bible says, the day you hear my voice, harden not your heart to it. Wherever you are, I want to invite you to come this day from wherever you are in Jesus' name. as God has commanded us to do and yet there is room pray you've been blessed by the word of God today amen let's do our offering prayer let's pray. eternal father I offer to you not only the sacrifice of praise but my dependence on your providential care I am the constant recipient of your care it is in and through you that I experience joy and the fulfillment of my highest aspirations. For shelter, food, and clothing, I give you thanks. As I have freely received, now I freely give. I count giving, not as a loss, but as a privilege to sow into your kingdom. I thank you for the opportunity of giving and accept it as a means of supporting your church but as a means of opening the window of even greater blessing into my life. Your word is the basis of every seed I sow. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, 
shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I give freely today, understanding the promise of the Master is that if I give generously, graciously, and compassionately, these qualities will come back to me in full measure. As you have used me to bless others, you will also use others to pour blessings into me. In advance, I thank you that every need I will ever have in my life has already been met. I thank you that the devourer has been rebuked for my sake. I declare your covering over my faith, family, and finances. I rebuke the spirit of doubt and anxiety from my life. I receive your abundant provision for the challenges of today and the uncertainty of tomorrow. I give my tithe and life as a living testament to your faithfulness. I ask that you multiply this gift as well as the opportunity for me to give. In Jesus' name, amen. The grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest will and abide with these his people, both now, henceforth, and forever. Let's all say amen.